Lord, only you know what you're really doing. Lord, we are so not in control. I think it's the enemy, Lord, that lets us think that we have any control over our lives. And Father, I just thank you for the choices that you allow us to have. By those choices, Lord God, we can choose some very valuable things, some very wonderful things, Lord God, that you've laid before us. And I pray, Lord God, that we learn to value our choices, to understand the value, Lord God, that you've placed in our ability to choose. And Lord, I pray that you continue to draw us, save those lost in darkness, Lord. There's so many. And Father, Help us understand what it means to be the salt and light of the world. And so, Father, I thank you. I thank you that you led us, Lord. Come into your presence and study your word and just see what it does to us, right? In Jesus' name, amen. Let it do its thing. All right. Good morning, good morning. Welcome, everyone. We're just making sure that we sound as best as possible for you guys this morning. Most importantly, for the Lord. Amen. You guys ready to sing a little bit this morning? Get the spider webs out of the throat. I know Brother David's ready, amen? All right. As I was buried beneath my shade Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn Until I met you As I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide it was my turn Until I met you Here we go, sing it out You call my name Higher out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day Oh, you call my name I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day Now your mercy Now your mercy has saved my soul no that's right yeah your freedom is all that i know the old man knew jesus when i made you and you call my name Sin was heavy, but 
chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future, my eyes are open. That's when you call my name. I ran out of that grave. You sing. Out of the When you call my name, I ran out of the darkness to your glorious day. Just a church. You call my name. You call my Bless the Lord one more time. You guys are sounding amazing this morning. You call my name. I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness. To your glorious day. When you called our name. That's right. Out of the darkness to your glorious day. All right. Give yourself a high clap of praise right there. I'm just going to move this over just a little bit. My eyesight's getting bad. I'm only 42 years old already. I love it when you guys sing, man. It's just, it, 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 it eases the tension up here, but we know we're playing for God and nothing else matters, but it always helps when you got the congregation singing in and sounding amazing, amen? So you guys, don't, don't let up on me now. Just keep, just keep on singing, a joyful noise. Even though we probably think to the person left or right of us is probably taking that too far, but hey, they're in the Lord, so, so don't mess with them, amen? Somebody say God is good out there this morning. That's right. I searched the world, but he couldn't feel me. A man's empty praise and treasures that they are never enough. You came along That's right. and put me back together and every desire is how satisfied here in your love oh there's nothing it's better than you it's better than you Oh, there's nothing Oh, nothing is better than you Oh, there's nothing It's better 
Get a little bit louder. Hold it. All right, if he's done something for you this lifetime, let's sing it one more time, but with a purpose. Amen. Can we do that one more time? Oh, there's nothing 
It's better than you Oh, there's nothing It's better than you Lord, there's nothing Nothing Amen my shepherd he goes before me defender behind me I won't fear I'm filled with my cup's overflowing No weapon can harm me I won't be
sensitive. That's a, that was a wonderful song to end with. Um, we definitely need the Holy Spirit to get us through what's coming. And uh, what's coming is not sweet tarts and honey buns, I promise you. Uh, and it is uh, allergy season, and so Kleenexes are your best friends and, and um, sanitary wipes and sanitary dips because it is that season. And uh, we're not going to let the world put another fear on us, so we're just going to take care of business the right way. And just, if you're sick, stay home, please. Uh, if it's allergies, just, you know, stay clear of everybody if you're sneezing and coughing and all that thing. Uh, anyways. So, uh, the word conspiracy theory. You ever, been, you ever been labeled a conspiracy theorist? Christians get labeled can you put my PowerPoint on? Christians get labeled, or people get labeled conspiracy theorists all the time, right? And a conspiracy theorist is really just a, a theory about something you don't really know about. I think sometimes they, they just happen without you even realizing they're going to happen. Anybody remember, know what this is from? Jaws. Remember that? Amity, Amity Island? Uh, this is what they were selling, remember? And, and I think everybody was pure in their hearts and pure in their minds. They believed that it was just going to be the wonderful, most beautiful place. But it turned out it wasn't so friendly. But the conspiracy started when they wanted to hide the fact that the shark was in the water. They didn't start out, they didn't start out trying to trick everybody. They did it every year. They just, it, was just, it was real. It was from a pure place. But circumstances happened, and... The shark showed up, and apparently the shark had some intelligence and really was picking on some people. But the interesting thing is the shark took out the innocent people, and the innocent people just kind of became the, the bargaining chip, the bargaining tool. Innocent people become the bar bargaining chip, or, you know, those kind of things. You know these people hate us, right? You know that all these countries, listen, they hate Christians. They're, they are not ashamed of telling you. They tell you. Now, there are some good Iraqis. There are some good Pakistanis. As a matter of fact, one of the guys, one of the men in my life was from Lebanon. 
uh, he's an older gentleman, came here when he was 17. That would be back in the 60s when he showed up over here. Put himself through Baylor. Ended up owning all types of property and, 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 and rental places at Baylor. I met him through the tile business. I just met a lot of interesting people doing tile. And uh, he, he realized I was a Christian. He, he let me know how he became a Christian from his background in Lebanon and how the Lord just blessed him. And he was just blessed. And, uh, but here's the thing is, no, no matter how much people hate us, hate can be saved. This is what I'm saying. Anybody who has hate in their heart can still be saved. I'm just telling you. We, 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 we like to jump in on hate sometimes. When, 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 when what we've seen happen to innocent people, we hate the, the, the criminals that, that perpetrate on innocent victims. We hate that, and we get caught up in that hate. And let me tell you something. We are Christians, and, and especially in these days we live in, we are not allowed to jump in there. We need to, we need to take a more, not a passive necessarily road, but we need to understand that God is working, and we don't want to get in the way. You and your self-righteousness sometimes can get in the way of what God's trying to do with grace. I said this last week or a couple weeks ago, whatever. Who, who would have stoned King David when you found out he committed adultery, but it's written in the book? It's written in the law of Moses. There's no sacrifice for that. Everybody could have stood up and said, no, he don't get to get away with that. My brother-in-law, when he committed adultery, he was stoned to death. My brother was stoned to death. My sister was stoned to death. King David, he, he's, he's better than everybody else. You see? That's when Paul goes. That's when Paul, in the book of Romans, said, who are you to judge? Because he understood at this, because remember, he was a hater. Hating and murdering Christians. Hating and murdering Christians, and plotting against Christians, and yet he becomes 13, writes 13 books of the Bible. Paul the Apostle. We would have stoned him. How many of you, you know, would have, would have stoned David for the murder of Uriah? Two times. He could have been stoned twice. But what we have to learn is we have to learn to walk a real fine line as Christians because we have a, we have a responsibility to expose sin and call out sin. But I'm just telling you, in the days that we live in, they hate us. And you know that right now that war that's going on over there, in the last several years, have just, it's, it's almost like there's been a boiling pot and things are just rising to the top. Amen. It's rising to the top. It's, we're, we're, I mean, speechless. How many of you have been speechless the last several years? Speechless. Speechless. Crazy. They hate us everywhere that there's the Islamic State, the Muslims. Not all Muslims, because there's different sects. There's like the Christian sect. They're not all Christians either, you know what I mean? But there's no such thing as a Muslim from God anyways, because there's only Christians, man. Jesus said, I am the only way. And for us to say they could be a way, that could be a way, is a, is, a, is a slap in the face to truth. That's a hard thing to say. That's a, that's a hard place to stand. Well, you better stand there. Because let me tell you something, there's, it's coming. There's signs. I didn't know that. I had no idea that they had. I knew they couldn't go in certain parts of the, the country, their own country. And now, now, remember, all this that you're watching on the news, that's all Israel. West Bank, Gaza Strip, that's all Israel territory, but Palestinians live there. There's been, and, and see, you might not have been paying attention now, and it's all coming to, in my mind, it's coming together. But all these peace accords have been outlining areas where they could live and work these things out. Well, it's not the people's fault that politicians are the ones determining where those boundaries are at and how it works. But one of the things that Israel had to agree on were these signs. And for, and for Palestinians, they can go into Israel, occupied territory, but Jewish people cannot cross. It's forbidden. Look, it even says this. 
dangerous to your lives to cross that boundary. Imagine if we put them on America's borders. We'd have every lawyer from Yale University on us. And, and you know what? Here's the deal. It's, it's Acts chapter 8. Turn me to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. I just want to read, um, we're going to jump to chapter 9, but I just want to read the very beginning of chapter 8 again just to kind of remind you, this is the character, we're, we're meeting this, the Apostle Paul when he was Saul. And it says, now Saul was consenting to his death, and at that, at that time great persecution arose against the church, which was uh, at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And then verse 3 says, And as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. That word chaos is what happens when a tornado or a F5 or a Category 5 hurricane hits. That's what it leaves behind. It's chaos. That's what Paul was doing. He was trying to cause chaos to the church. He was freaking everybody out. Everybody's coming to a new way of believing in things. And next thing you know, you got this guy with authority with soldiers with him, able to arrest you. Now, have you seen on any, um, have you seen on any, uh, um, never mind, never mind. When, when, when Saul was, was, was causing havoc on the church, the, 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 the Christians that were, from other places that were hanging out in Jerusalem, went back home is what they did. Last week we saw with Stephen, so let's jump to chapter 9. So Paul is now on a mission to hunt Christians. He's on a mission to hunt Christians. Think about that. Think about his passion is to hunt Christians. Now, what we're seeing over there in the Middle East are several generations of people being raised with a mentality that we are the enemy and the Jews are also the devil's child, basically. Raised that way from youth. Go and watch some North Korea documentaries on how they raised their youth. They, they got those kids convinced that Kim Jong-un was, was flown in on a goose. That's how he was born. He was flown in on a goose or something like that. I'm just telling you, they teach these kids that's the truth. And they believe that's the truth. Look, we have David Koresh right down the street that had people convinced. We have Jim Jones have people convinced. It's not that difficult to believe that people can be convinced some stupid stuff, some way far off stuff. Listen, this whole world is looking to believe something. It's looking to believe something. And when you're stuck in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a place like Gaza Strip, you got no hope. You got no choice unless God himself goes in there. And I will tell you this. There's a website called Muslims Coming to Christ or Muslims for Christ, and, and I've watched video after video of Muslims testifying that the Lord Jesus Christ would show up in their room. Show up in their room, and they would be converted to Christianity. First thing they did was run to a pastor, run to a Christian, run to somebody they knew was a Christian, and they shared their... Let me tell you something. That's real. So what I'm trying to tell you is we have to be careful about hating those people that hate us. This is what I'm trying to tell you. Because God is doing a work. He's doing a work in people just like he's doing a work in Saul. At this point in time, Saul is the number one enemy of Christ. The number one enemy. This guy's getting a license to kill Christians, basically. A letter from the high priest Caiaphas. From the high priest Caiaphas to go and rest and kill Christians. And if me and you are a Christian, we're ducking and dodging, hiding. That's all we can do. Listen, King David, when he was running from Saul, you know what he did? He did exactly what those Gazas, those, 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 Hamas people did, he would go into their little villages, he would raid their villages and massacre their people. 
just like Hamas did. It said that he would wipe them all out so they couldn't go back and tell the Philistine, the, the Philistine king that it was him killing all these Philistines. Those were innocent people. But who's innocent anyways? See, we're going to get to that point in the end. Because in the end, the only one innocent in this room is Kingston. <laughs> Even Hannah's not as innocent no more as Kingston's innocent. I'm just kidding. You're always innocent, baby. Look, and see, that's, that's the point that we're going to, that, that's the point I want to make this morning. That's the point I want you to think about is do you have a right to hate back? Do you feel like you have a right to hate back? When you see what they did, look, you can't watch those videos and see those. I watched a video of them kids before they died. We're in a restroom hiding from the Hamas soldiers, hiding, hiding, talking. And, you know, you, you can just tell they're walking to the door, just kind of looking like, they don't, they, don't, they don't think it's a big deal. And then the next video, they show them all dead. They had no idea what was coming. Darkness is like that. Man, darkness is real. And, uh, you know, I want to tell you to make sure you're locked and loaded because, you know, you need to be that anyway. So you're in Texas. You always need to be locked and loaded. But you never go on the hunt. You know what I'm saying? You never go on the hunt. You always take the defensive position. As long as you take the defensive position, God will always be your offense. He's the offense. He's the one that goes before you. He's the one that's, that's making sure that everything is out of your way. When he Because he says, I'll direct your path if you put your trust in me. Like trust with all your heart, soul, and mind. And he'll direct your path. And if he's going to direct your path, you can trust that the next step is from him. If you're just, now if you're hunting to take somebody out, I'm going to tell you, he said, love your enemies, do good to those who want to do you bad. He said, if they treated me this way, they're going to treat you that way. So what we have to do is be careful to de- just be defenders, not on the offense, not on the hunt for the enemy. We don't have to look for the enemy. <laughs> He's here. You know, you don't have to look for him. He's here. Um, Acts chapter 9. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder. Notice, murder. That's, 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 that's a commandment. But, he's, but in his mind, he's justified because you know what? It's in the word. It's in the word. <laughs> They're blaspheming in his mind. They're, it's in the word. And so we got to be careful when we shove the word in somebody's face. It's in the word. It's in the word. But you know what? Sometimes the word's got a, got a heart attitude instead of a wisdom attitude. And so we have to learn the difference between the heart and the wisdom, right? Because it's not all naturally common sense of the world's common sense. It's supernatural common sense. It says, uh, Ask letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus so that, it, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Look, he don't care who it is, men or women. And he journeyed. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul. Why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? Notice he says, Lord. (laughs) Who are you, Lord? He don't know him. (coughs) Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, arise and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. Listen, it says go into the city and you will be told what must to do. There's a guy named Ananias waiting there that God has prepared for him. And I'm telling you, that's who we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be the Ananias is waiting for God to bring in the, the, those bound in darkness and hate and all this craziness that are just lost in the way. When God deals with them in their brokenness, in their messed upness, or in their on the way to kill people, and God... Stops him in the track. We go to prisons just for that purpose. 
We go to prisons just for that purpose. The first time we went to prison, and you sit in a group of girls, and then this one says she was part of killing somebody with her boyfriend. This one said that she was molested, so she killed the, 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 the stepdad that was molesting her daughter. This one allowed the stepdad to molest this kid and kill this kid, and you're sitting with them. And you're the light. And you're the, you're the, you're the, you're, you're the one that they, God sent to, to, he sent them to you. Are you ready? You have hate in your heart. Where are you at? See, I want to be in the perfect position for whatever's coming spiritually. I want to make sure that when I wake up in the morning, my, my heart is going, okay, God, what's going to happen today? What am I going to watch on the news? What am I paying attention to? What I need to be ready for? What I need to be... Because, pre- listen, all I can do is be ready for what I understand and where the Lord leads me. I can't be ready for things that I don't know is coming because a lot of these things... I didn't know we're coming. Did you, know, did you see COVID coming? Nope. Didn't see COVID coming. And COVID turned out to be not what we thought it was. So I, what I'm saying is, I believe America tried possibly at one time to start out selling Amity Beach. But the reality was there were sharks here, demons here, a land full of demons, demon worshipers before we got here. We're not the holy land. We are a holy people in an unholy land that God is using to be the light to those haters of God and his purpose. They have no idea what he's up to. He's up to saving. It is his will that not one should perish. That's what it says. It's his will that not one should perish. What if you're the one that has to save the one, but you're out of position? You're not where you're supposed to be. And Ananias was in position. He was where he was supposed to be, not where he was not supposed to be. When you need a broom and you go to the broom closet and there ain't no broom in there, you try to sweep up some glass and the broom's not where it's supposed to be. That's frustrating. God wants us to be, and you know, I believe, that you, I believe that we know where we're supposed to be. Right? 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 We should. Just, just in the course of, of life. So, referring back to this moment, Paul is talking and this is kind of, this is, this, we're going we're gonna to follow the story, but I want to go back and just kind of catch Paul's perspective of what is happening right now, how he's seeing it, how he's explaining it, the revelation, the understanding he got from what happened to him. And I think that, that'll help us better understand what's going on inside of his mind and his heart so that we can see how real God is, I, I think. Then he said, I am indeed a Jew born in Tarsus of Sicilia but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamal- that guy, Gamaliel, Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law and was zealous towards God as you all are today. I persecuted this way to the death. He ain't holding back. Binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. And also the high priest bears me witness and all the counsel of the elders from whom I also received letters to the brethren and went to Damascus to bring in chains even those who were there in Jerusalem to be punished. Now it happened as I journeyed and came near Damascus at about noon, suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me and I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So I answered, who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. And those who were with me indeed saw the light and were afraid, but they did not hear the voice of him who spoke to me. That's interesting to let you know that the Lord will speak directly to you in any circumstances. So I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, arise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all the things which are appointed for you to do. And since I could not see for the glory of the light, being led by the hands of those who are with me, I came into Damascus. And so he's telling us, 
the Lord had somebody to help him. We're here to help each other. We're here to help each other walk this out so that we can be and understand our calling together because we're not, we don't all have the same calling, do we? we, we I'm, not, I'm not the one that's supposed to carry the gun and stand out there and protect the church. That's somebody else's calling. Those are, those are, those are different callings, so just like teaching and, and these different things. They're all different callings. In Galatians 1, referring back to this situation, he has even a different perspective of it, which I think is interesting and I think that we should pay attention to because he says, but I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to men. For I neither received it from man nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Very important, revelation and understanding and opening up to for you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism. I love sharing my testimony. I love hearing testimonies. I love hearing how people get saved. But I love my testimony. My testimony has been my jewel. since I've been saved 30-something years now, in, in, in 32 years. And my, my testimony, I told my son the other day, I said, you know, my testimony has so many different things to it that had something to do with TV and what was on TV that I Googled it about a year ago to make sure that what I remembered happened. And I was, pretty, I was pretty close. I was pretty on point with what was on TV at the time. And my son said, well, you were high that night, Dad. I go, you're right, son. So I did, I did have good clarity to remember a lot of it. So I love my testimony. And I'll share it sometimes. But it says, uh, for you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. The gates of hell shall not prevail. Paul was the number one warrior for Satan at the time, and, and look what God did, converted him. <laughs> that's, that's what you want God to do with your enemies, convert them. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. Listen to what he, he's saying. The way we've done it is more important to me than anything new. But it, when it pleased God, this is the deal, but when it pleased God, listen to what he says, who separated me from my mother's womb, just like Jeremiah said that he was called before. God knows what he's doing with us. That's why abortion is of the devil. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me. Why? So that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those apostles before me, but I went Arabia and turned. Look, he disappears for 14 years. He goes away for 14 years. He disappears and lets the Lord just deal with him for 14 years and get him ready to come back. And it's interesting that God would take a guy that was all about the, the law and the perfectness and the, the purity of the law would now be called to go preach that to Gentiles who have care less about the law, and then send Peter, who didn't care about the law, to the lawgivers. Chuck Colson, remember, anybody, you remember him? He was in the Watergate scandal, uh, got arrested for trying to cheat uh, with Nixon, went to prison, got saved. Chuck Colson Ministries, uh, Center for Christian Worldview. When I got saved, he was on the radio, and man, I loved listening to his little things about what's going on in the world and just kind of updating. He's gone on to be with the Lord, but his ministry is still going on. And he says, had it not been for his bad conduct that put him in prison that got him saved, he was very thankful for his bad conduct getting <laughs> saved at the very end of his life, right? Now, this guy, I, I watched a video, a documentary on this guy years ago, and this guy is, this is going to be funny. His, his, his name from when he was in the Army of Africa, South Africa, was Sergeant Butt Naked because he would go into battle with nothing but shoes and a sword. He says he's responsible for 20,000 people's deaths. He, would recruit, he recruited 20,000 young men and made them eat a human heart, take bites of human heart, made every one of those kids take bites of human heart to condition them to kill to condition them to just to, to not look at humans as human. Then he got saved. And he's preaching the gospel where he once destroyed people's lives. Pastor, uh, uh, so this is the testimony. 
1996, a pastor in Liberia, Bishop Kunkun, claimed he heard from God to fast for 54 days to deliver Blaley's rampage. After fasting, Pastor Kunkun went into his shrine in Liberia to preach to him. After Bailey, Bailey received the visit from the pastor, he claimed Jesus appeared to him in a blinding light. This is before he even knew the Bible existed, the story of Paul, and told him to repent for his sins or die. Joshua then gave his life to Christ and went on confession spree to confess his sins in churches and to the relatives of the victims he killed. He's now president of the End Time Train Evangelistic Ministries in Liberia. Recognize that guy? I'm sure you do. You know that your old pastor writes him. Joe Fock, this is the son of Sam, right? The serial killer in prison. Apparently got a hold of Pastor Joe's tapes or books, and it, it transformed him. He got saved, and uh, the Lord's using him in prison where he's at. Me and you, that's kind of hard stuff to hear, especially if your loved one was a victim of this guy. It's, it's, hard, it's hard to think that God would forgive the person that murdered your loved one. That's a very hard and difficult thing, but yet, and, and, and that's what God is doing. Look, remember these names? Jeffrey Dahmer, Carla Faye Tucker, Ted Bundy, Susan Atkins, and Charles Tex Watson. They're all also saved too. Matter of fact, uh, Jeffrey Dahmer, the pastor that felt led to go and visit him in prison, when he would go visit him in prison and his, and his church found out he was going to visit him, they left. He didn't have a church no more. Maybe one or two people. People did not want to be associated with the pastor that was leading Jeffrey Dahmer to the Lord. But that's, 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 that's unfortunately, you know, the measure of some people's Christianity. And I understand because you're human and you feel entitled to your feelings. You feel entitled to your own thoughts. You feel entitled to your own way of looking at life. You feel entitled to it because it's your life and God's given you a choice. Now, if you were born in Hamas, you wouldn't be entitled to your think, feelings or you wouldn't be entitled to your thoughts. You would be told how to think who to pray to, how many times to pray, pray to them, when to pray to them. You'd be told how to dress, when you could go shop, how much you could buy, how much you could eat, how much you could purchase, all those things. In China, North Korea, India, they don't have what we have here. And I'm going to tell you this, that when, 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 when the time comes, that part of who we are as America is going to sting. You thought 2020 stung. What's coming is going to really sting. Because it's going to be very, very uncomfortable. Some of you didn't have no electricity during the wintertime like 2020 when that storm hit. It was uncomfortable. It was freaking out. People were, people were burning furniture, man. People were burning their furniture in fireplaces because they couldn't get out. Think about that on a bigger scale. Think about that when it's a lockdown and, you don't really, and, and, and the reasons why don't even really matter to us, but, it's, but they, they have the power to do it because we've created and allowed to be created an enemy that is out to get us. And so our best options, best options, just draw near. Just draw near to truth. Stay in your lane. Recognize your lane, though. Find your lane. Because that's another issue is people don't, don't know where they're at, don't know which way they're going, don't know how to walk this Christianity out, don't know who to walk it out with. And what we're trying to do is create a tribe of Christians in these last days that kind of understand that and kind of go, you know what, I got a little bit to help you if you need a little bit. I see you helping other people. I see what you're doing for this person. I want to be a part of that circle too. Instead of doing it on Facebook with just your, your, your debts, whatever, you do it a debt of love. Just taking care of each other just because you love them and you, you have the means to help somebody. <laughs> You're not, you know, we, we have to be more willing to, to let our lives, have, let Christ have our lives. Where's my chick clicker at? There we go. In Galatians 3, Paul is also talking about what he was before. And what he is now, and look at his perspective, and, and, and look what he's saying. Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. 
For if there had been a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. He's saying that if we could have been saved and going to heaven because we could obey the, the, the rules of this book, it, we would have, it, it would have been able to provide that. But it never allowed, because of who we are, that opportunity to happen. We, we took that off the table when we were born in this flesh and blood, basically. We didn't have the ability. The, the law didn't have, we t- couldn't clean us. It says, but the scripture has confined all. This is the good part. It's sad and good at the same time. It's confined all of us under sin. Unfortunately, even my Kingston is going to have to get saved. But before, for those who believe, Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe, but before faith came, we were kept under guard. Listen to what he's saying. I thought that was interesting. We're kept under guard by the law, which means it, 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 don't follow those gods. Don't, don't do these things that's going to make it harder to walk after me. Because when you start bringing in all the idol worship of these other countries, when I start saying I'm the only way, you're going to want us to have sex outside of marriage. You're still going to want to party a little bit. You're still going to want to be both in the out. The, you want to be able to go dance your night out and have a good time and not think about anything or anybody. Put yourself at risk. Spend your money on those things without thinking about how you could be helping the kingdom of God, your neighbor, others, be a light in this world. Listen, we are called to be a light in this world. God is saving. He's not going to wait necessarily until they're all, till the crisis comes. He's going to start saving people now. He's going to be bringing people to us tomorrow. And we just need to be ready and understand that he didn't save you to just so you can go tell everybody you're saved. He saved you so that you could lead people who, especially those God's stirring in their hearts. I mean, there's there's people in here because they go to AA together and they invite each other to come. There's people in here because you just crossed somebody's path and you just invited somebody to come. You're in here because you heard something. You just, so people are here for different reasons. And, and, and let me just tell you something, that the main thing that we want to make sure that when people find stumbling these doors is that this is what they hear mo- most from and, 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 and truth. And, and I hope that um, we're doing it that way. Paul understood in the end that Jesus Christ had to be born, that the, the Passover was the lesson for this, that when they had Passover, on the night that God was going to finally deliver them from the bondage of the Egyptians and the slavery that they were under. God was going to deliver them that night, but they could only be delivered, or at least the firstborn was shedding the blood and putting it over the door of the lamb. And that, that, that first Passover was pointing to the cross. And nobody knew it. Nobody knew it. Nobody understood it. Even the disciples did not understand it until they got the Holy Spirit. It's important that you have the Holy Spirit. It's important that you don't be scared of it. You don't just want it in portions. You don't just want it conveniently. You need the Holy Spirit when you probably want it the least. The most you need the Holy Spirit. And I pray that my family, the, the, the people around me could see that I'm walking the way I'm supposed to walk. And uh, I mean, I'm not perfect, I promise you. But who is? The only one who's perfect. We, 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 we are watching, and, we're, and I was thinking this morning how you know, I got saved in 1992. And in 1992, um, you know, Desert Storm had just kind of started in 90, that, around that time. And uh, before I got saved, I never paid attention to the world around me. I just never, never paid attention. All I was worried about was, was who got the weed, who got the coke, who's the, where's the party at, where's this at? You know, I'm in my 20s, you know, just stop thinking about those things. Didn't know to think those things. We just, we just didn't have people around us showing us, did we, Pop? We just didn't have people showing us the light, the truth. And uh, we just followed our gut instincts. We just, we just followed what was natural. But in 1992, 
the Lord stopped me in my tracks on a Tuesday night in May of 1992, right next to the glass plant at a house. I remember who I was with. And that, that day, my life changed, but I didn't know anything. And I remember going, what do I do with, what do I do with what just happened? And then my wife at the time said, well, call your friend that was inviting you to church. I went, yes. Hey, where's Rick at? Oh, he's at the church. They're working on it. Where's it at? Wrote the address. I know where that's at. I drove over there. My life ain't never been the same. The Lord filled me with his spirit. He didn't keep me, he didn't, he didn't keep me perfect because I, I, had, I had to learn the hard way in some things. But, but that night, I, I've never been the same. I've never been the same. And, uh, and I pray that, that what God is doing in your life and the Holy Spirit in your life, you'll never be the same either. Here in Waco, Texas, is an opportunity to glorify the Lord with the rest of your life, with what you have left, and, and, and honor the Lord with what you have left, because who knows if he's putting you in the right position to be there for broken people, man. You just don't know who's broken out there, who's got hate in their heart. You know, there's people that are searching for truth out there, and, and if we're sitting here holding signs, you know, God hates fags, we're never going to win nobody. Can't do that. Can't do that. That's not what God called us to do. Amen? Man, you know, I'm, I'm 58 years old, and I'm tripping out on this world. This is, not, this is not what I was planning on, but I'm thankful that I'm here, and I'm thankful I'm about it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for everybody that wanted church at 1030. Got it today, Lord. Lord, I thank you for the time changes. We just thank you that you mix us up, Lord. You don't, you don't let us get comfortable in anything, Lord. Thank you for the seasons that change. Thank you, Lord, for even the allergies. Let us know we're alive. And Lord, I just thank you for your word this morning. Father, I pray that as Paul's life was transformed in a, in a moment's time, Lord God. You had a moment ordained, and you have so many moments ordained for others, Lord God. And I pray that, Lord, that we'll be the good Ananias. We'll be the one that's ready, Lord God, to lay hands on them and, and help them and lead them to truth, Lord God. And so, Father, I pray that your spirit is alive and working this morning. If you don't know the truth like you like your heart is telling you there's something missing. This morning, all you got to do is just call out to him. He hears you. He hears your heart's cry, and he will always answer. And if there's anything that we can do, we're here to help you. And so, Lord, we just thank you for putting us where you've got us. And we just ask you to bless the rest of our week. In Jesus' name, amen. Go Cowboys.